and we're right there. Perfect. <laughs> okay, thanks for jumping in because it would have been a very boring talk if I'd gone the whole way with uh, no images. So you can see on the top above my image, there's the uh, the ammonite and the walrus, my animals, and rays, trilobite, and, and ratfish. But as I said, I'm a paleobotanist. So this, this is going to be a talk in three parts. It's always going to start with fossil plants. It's going to end up somewhere else. And I hope to drag it back to walruses and ammonites in each case, or at least in some cases. Um, let's see here. So uh, this is the image that Ray did for British Columbia and Alberta. And this talk will be occurring in uh, two, two parts of the talk will be occurring in Nunavut in the Northwest, and then one part in, in Alberta. But I just love to show that these gray, gray troll maps because they just show the premise that fossils genuinely are everywhere. And I am completely baffled why people aren't more interested in fossils because of the most amazing things on planet Earth. Um, when Ray and I visited Vancouver Island, I was utterly delighted when Graham Beard showed me the skull of Rosie, the Qualicum walrus. I actually took a pilgrimage back to Ottawa to see Dick Harrington's collections. And here was the complete skeleton of Rosie the walrus collected by uh, Graham Beard's guys on the beach there, not far from Qualicum. And uh, the fact that walruses today don't have that sort of extension of the range. I mean, we find fossil walruses off the coast of Virginia as well from Pleistocene deposits. So it's not a surprise they were down in Vancouver Island, but it made me feel very warm and welcome. And of course, uh, the Salish Sea and the fossils from Hornby and Courtney and all the uh, Cretaceous fossils of Vancouver Island are profoundly pleasing to me, all the different heteromorph ammonites and uh, the marine organisms and even the more recent uh, dinosaurs. So all that to say that Vancouver Island has is, is been pretty much square in my wheelhouse with walruses and ammonites all along. And of course, some years ago, I think back around 2000, there was a, a nice find of um, Campanian fossil leaves at Cranberry Arms. And I can't remember the name of the guy that did that uh, survey, but that's a pretty interesting flora. The Nanaimo flora really deserves to be looked at from a paleobotanical point of view um, in the future. So um, just a little bit of background about myself. Um, Ray's image uh, here, prehistoric leaf lust, hard to explain. Why do people care about leaves instead of more spectacular fossils? Well, leaves are the most spectacular of all fossils, I would argue. And it, it, for me, it started this little town of Republic in Eastern Washington. You can see the yellow Volkswagen rabbit. That's my car um, back from the... Uh, early 90s. I, I used to hang out with Wes Weir at the Burke Museum in Seattle. And in 1977, when I was 16 years old and had a driver's license, which made both Wes and I mobile, because Wes could not drive a car. So the second I turned 16 years old and got a driver's license, Wes and I were free to travel around the American West looking for fossils. And we came to this very corner where that little kid is. That's not me. That's just a random little kid. <laughs> um, but we parked the car there and we poked around and didn't find anything at all. I got ready to go. We walked around, you know, and looked and just, there was shale everywhere, but there's not a single fossil on it at all. And I crossed the street to the other side and kicked a rock over. And it was a piece of paper shale like this. And when it popped open, it had this very fossil on it. This is the Republic Discovery fossil. That's the one that I found in 1977. Um, just popped open with my foot next to the car. And Wes and I are like, huh, that's pretty nice. Let's uh, dig right here. So we dug in the drainage ditch there. And we know that uh, Republic had been known for its fossil flowers. We didn't know what they looked like, but we found one of these incredible Florisantia flowers. They're actually pretty common at Republic. They're a member of the, um, the chocolate family and uh, they are exquisite calyxes. And they've even found with several in a group on a slab. So you get a fossil bouquet. But the Republic flora is really interesting. It has a huge diversity of leaves, fruits, flowers, cones, seeds, branches, plus insects, plus fish. And I'm sure that one day it'll produce a bird and some other amazing things. It's just this incredible um, Eocene Lagerstatten deposit that has stuff from uh, of all kinds and just exquisitely preserved. There's a little museum there now called the Stone Rose Center that Wes really put all of his energy into getting started. But it was really this discovery that got uh, me into paleobotany. And it was uh, once in, no turning back. That was a long time ago, um, and I'm still going strong. The fossils from Republic have a couple of notable things which are very interesting plants. One is metasequoia. That's a Republic fossil in the middle. 
And on the right is a, a branch of modern metasequoia and the left, a bunch of metasequoia trees. They're a deciduous conifer. And this species of tree was discovered a living, uh, was discovered um, first in the 1850s near Bellingham, Washington in the Chuckanite group. And it wasn't discovered as a living plant till World War II in central China, in Hupei province. And so these, um, these living fossils that they were, but they're also natives of North America that no longer live in North America. And I did a, a, an exhibit at the um, Morris Arboretum in Philadelphia in 1983 called The Return of the Native, this sort of returning of ornamental things that actually lived here at one point in the past. And so this interesting question, what would cause Metasequoia to live in North America, go extinct here, but still be alive in China? There's also Cercidophyllum, another example of this thing. And it turns out there's many, many examples of fossils in Republic that are living today in East Asia, but extinct in North America. And they've been reintroduced as uh, is sort of ornamental trees in North America. But that, that really got me thinking, even in those early days, like what are these Japanese fossils doing in Eastern Washington? And if you look at where Republic is in the globe, you see an interesting pattern. On the right-hand side, of you, you can see the map of Asia. That's the homeland of Metasequoia and Cercidophyllum. Well, not exactly the homeland. It's where they live today. You can see Republic. And you can see three other dark patches, Eastern North America and Europe and Eastern Asia. These are areas that have deciduous broadleaf forests. And these forests we now know are remnants of a once, once continuous polar forest that had these kinds of plants. And as the world's climate cooled, that forest was replaced by tundra or ice or boreal forest. And we're left with these three remnants of the once widespread Eocene polar forest. Um, so if you think about it this way, North America has sort of, it's like a triangle in a way. There's three ways to get into North America. You come in through Asia across the Bering Land Bridge. You can come in from South America across the Isthmus of Panama. And you could get there from Scandinavia, not so easily now, but if you go back to the Eocene when the Northern Atlantic wasn't so wide before Iceland was there, there was probably a land bridge from Scandinavia into Greenland, into North America. So um, this is, this is uh, what we call a, a room with three doors. North America has three doors into it, a Northeast, a Northwest and a South door. And anything that comes and goes from this continent has to go through one of those passageways. And it was the discussion of this passageways that got me into the Arctic in the very first bit. In 1983, I met Leo Hickey, who was a paleobotanist at the uh, Smithsonian at that time. He's actually worked in the building where I work right now, but then he moved off to Yale University. And he had started a collaboration with Mary Dawson from the Carnegie, Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh. And, and uh, he and Mary had were going to the high north of Canada to look for fossil plants, to look what to see if they could find evidence for that northeastern door into North America, the bridge, land of bridge from Scandinavia to um, North America. And I heard about this and I told Leo, I said, I will do anything to accompany you guys on this trip to the Arctic. And fortunately, it didn't make me um, do anything, but he did accept me as a team member. And I went up north for the first time in 1984 with um, Mary Dawson, Leo Hickey, and Cliff Morrow from the Carnegie, but just the four of us for a, um, about a six week field season. And we went back in the summer of 85 as well. So two seasons in the high Arctic with Mary Dawson, who at that time was sort of this amazing woman who was leading the global exploration in the high North. She was the first person to find a pre Pleistocene vertebrate fossil above the Arctic circle anywhere in the world. Um, and she was focused on Ellesmere Island, that big chunk of land, which is not that much smaller than Great Britain. Um, that's located at the very top of the Canadian Arctic archipelago. And um, you can see here's a map of Ellesmere Island. To its left is Axel Heiberg, which is not that much smaller than Ireland, and below it, Devon Island. I'm gonna talk about um, sites on all three of these places, but uh, you'll see those orange patches. The orange patches are the Eureka Sound Formation rocks that are Cretaceous to Eocene in age. And that was the target area for Mary Dawson's vertebrates and for Leo's fossils. And um, standard stuff in the Arctic, you go to Resolute uh, Bay, hop on a twin otter, you fly north and you eventually find a place to land the thing and start working in this incredible area that's not at all vegetated. There's no modern vegetation larger than the Arctic willow, which you can see a forest of in the foreground there. They're prostate willow trees. And in the backgrounds are helicopter and a thick coal seam. And coming out of the coal seam are crumbling 
yellowish rocks, which are in fact rocks, but they're also in fact trees. They're all petrified logs. And what's so interesting about these trees is they're actually compacted and squeezed flat. So you can see the sort of the oval growth rings here. Some of them even have like uh, isoclinally folded growth rings. The trees were jellified at some point in their history, literally squeezed flat. But um, there are also places where you can see in, in situ standing tree trunks um, and actually whole forests of tree trunks and some quite giant trees. Here's one in a place called Stenkel Fjord. And this tree was about over a meter and a half in diameter. So you're looking at a place that's today somewhere like a thousand miles north of the nearest living tree. And here are these fossil trees that are full on a redwood size. And when you dig into the, the ground, you find out that they're in fact things like Cercidophyllum, like we collected in Republic, likes living today in China, and things like Metasequoia, the Don Redwood. So that is right out of the gate, a vindication of the premise that the modern deciduous forests today are a remnant of a forest that once lived in the high Arctic. And since these discoveries were made, similar fossils have been found in Greenland, Northern Alaska, across the top of Siberia. And there's a similar story in Antarctica as well, where you have both Patagonian and Australian plants living as, as fossils in Antarctica. So we know now um, much better than we knew in 1983 that the world was quite warm in the Eocene and that there were no polar ice caps at all at that point in time and that there were forests where there today are ice caps. Um, here's one unusual fossil. It took us a while to realize what we were looking at here, but this is actually the center part of a lotus leaf. Here's a lotus leaf. So there were lotus in the high Arctic as well. And um, Mary here on her knees, as all good vertebrate paleontologists spend most of their life on their knees or crawling around looking for small things with Cliff Morrow in the background. This is at a site on Ellsbury Island where Mary had found some fossil crocodiles and turtles. And um, here's a, a small skull of an animal, a dermopteran, a flying lemur that uh, Cliff Morrow found. And that 65 year old guy literally did a cartwheel after he found this uh, beautiful little skull. You're looking into the palate, you can see both rows of teeth there. That's an exquisite little fossil Eocene skull. Um, so all those things allowed us to build this diorama, which I um, designed for the American Museum of Natural History was part of their extreme mammals exhibit that traveled around the country. And you can see a Corypidon, which is an Eocene animal, lotuses, metasequoia trees, uh, Cercidophyllum plants in a very different looking uh, world of the Arctic than one you might conceive of today. Now, um, I'm working towards my first splendid Canadian fossil. You may wonder when that first fossil is coming up as if these fossils haven't been splendid enough, but we're working towards um, one that hopefully will surprise you. 84, towards the end of the season, I guess it was in 85, we ended up going to Axel Heiberg Island, which is almost the size of Ireland and uninhabited. It's an amazing place. Later, I think later in the 80s, they found the fossil forest on the eastern side of Axel Heiberg Island, the mummified forests. But we were going to a place called Strand Fjord because of its geology. So the arrow points to where Strand Fjord is, and here's a, a view of Strand Fjord. I think they call it Strand Fjord because a lot of icebergs get stranded in the fjord. And um, it's a really foreboding and bleak place. It's kind of a terrifying place. You really feel like you're at the edge of the world. In fact, you're at the edge of the Arctic Ocean in that space. And um, here's from Google Earth, you can see a, a view of Strand Fjord on an ice free day. You can see where our camp is. And every day we would hike 10 kilometers along the coastline to East Creek and West Creek. And if you look at East Creek and West Creek, you look at the lay of the land. Those are vertically tilted layers of rock. And there's literally 10,000 feet of Paleocene and Eocene rock tilted on end, vertical. So if you're marching along, you can measure long sections. And then we measured up East Creek and up West Creek, and we measured a 10,000 foot thick section. That's, that is a remarkable section. It's two miles thick of of Paleocene Eocene rocks. And we were really trying to understand if we could find fossils in these rocks. They're amazing rocks. Um, every morning we had to wade across uh, the creeks to get across that big river delta. You see Leo Hickey in the foreground, Mary Dawson behind him, and Cliff Morrow behind Mary. 
sadly, all three of these people are no longer with us. And it's really, um, you know, I, I get quite emotional. When I think about these trips because uh, Mary just passed away last year. Leo passed away in 2013 and, and Cliff before that. But these were amazingly hardy, smart people who I had the privilege of being in the high Arctic with. We'd, we'd wade this stream and then we'd walk along the um, coastline to get to these incredible tilted vertical rocks. You see them going across the outcrop as sort of vertical stripes and lines and work our way up the valleys, measuring the layers, looking for fossils. On the way out there, there were quite a few um, little small icebergs next to the beach. And I was um, nervous about polar bears because small icebergs and polar bears kind of look exactly the same. And so I would tend to walk high and away from the beach. And uh, Cliff was not afraid of polar bears. So he walked down near the beach and that became uh, his secret for this incredible fossil. And here's a exposure. You can see how these rocks are tilted nearly vertical, made them easy to measure their thickness. Um, and they had uh, a number of fossils. You can see fossil leaves, these broadleaf plants um, in them, but they weren't that well preserved. They were in very hard rock. And it, it turned out to not be a very prolific fossil site for us, but it was an interesting one. But um, on one day we walked back into camp and Cliff Morrow had found a fossil narwhal skull. <laughs> Splendid fossil number one. Uh, it was well above the beach. It was on a uh, beach ridge. So at very least it was a, from an earlier Pleistocene deposit. It was probably raised up by isostatic rebound and laid on the beach. And as the ice moved out, then the, um, the beach itself rebounded to a higher elevation. It was about seven feet long, had a well-preserved ivory tusk and a good portion of the skull was still attached to the, um, the narwhal skull. And here it is back in his tent wrapped up for being transported back. We, um, at the end of the season, we shipped it down to Ottawa where it became part of Dick Harrington's collections. I was looking for this specimen when I went to look at, for Rosie the walrus because I wanted to see it again and I could not find it. So I've got to talk to um, Daniel Frazier at uh, the Ottawa collection and see where this specimen is. Because I'm curious, I know that there have been a radiometric date done on this specimen and I believe it's, I don't know what the date is. So I think it's, it is a Pleistocene narwhal. And there are a few other Pleistocene narwhals known but they're pretty rare as fossils. And it was quite stunning to uh, see one of these things. This site, Strand Fjord, is outside of the, narwhal, the modern narwhal, narwhal range as well. So there aren't narwhals living there today. Um, and here you can see Leo, as he always was, quite the supervisor, supervising the wrapping of this uh, narwhal tusk with Mary and Cliff. And that's the entirety of our expedition, uh, uh, that group there. And, and uh, we hauled that off. And here's uh, uh, Julius Stoney, who's, who's been doing amazing artwork for us. He did all the murals in the new deep time exhibit at the National Museum of Natural History, um, loaned me this image of a, a narwhal, a modern narwhal, but of course the fossil one wouldn't be far off of this one. But if you do come to the National Museum to see the deep time exhibit, you'll see a very unusual fossil, which is this, sorry, we have one more piece here. This is a, we did an exhibit about narwhals as well at the museum, a traveling exhibit, which is traveling around the country right now, which is a pretty cool exhibit with a lot of lore about narwhals. And um, we even had pond uh, inlet narwhal hunters come down and visit me in my office in Washington, DC, which is pretty great. So I'm getting stalked by narwhals. And just um, this spring, I received a, uh, a letter from a woman in Washington state who uh, inherited her uncle's collection. He was a Northwest trader and he had a narwhal skull in it, or sorry, narwhal tusk in it, which, um, we could only legally um, acquire at this National Museum if it was collected before 1971. And in fact, she had the documentation for it. So that tusk is coming to me um, next month from Seattle. So we have a, a really amazing collection of modern marine mammals here in Washington and a, a new narwhal tusk will be added to that one. But if you come to see the deep time exhibit, you're gonna see this beast, this um, Pliocene whale that was found in Peru, published in 2002 called Odobino sea tops. If you know Odobinus is the walrus, this is the walrus whale because like a narwhal, it has one long tusk, but it's retroflexed, it's points backwards like a um, walrus tusk. So it's a whale that looks like a walrus with the exception that it actually has two tusks. And you can see there's one very tiny tusk 
one very long tusk. If you look in the image. And like a narwhal, a narwhal basically has two tooth bases and one is aborted and the tusk grows out. And there are occasionally two tusked narwhals. Um, so this, is, this whale has the same sort of pattern as a narwhal does. It basically aborts one tooth and grows one out very long and one very short, which means it's an asymmetric, retroflexed, walrus-like, narwhal-like whale. Pretty cool, known from two skulls in, in uh, Peru. And here's um, Julius's reconstruction of a, nar a walrus whale feeding on the seafloor like walruses feed on the seafloor. As you see, walruses do a head down feeding using their tusk like a sled runner, scoot along the bottom and snarkle up clams, suck the meat out of the clams. And if you squint in the background, there's one of these um, marine sloths as well. There's a diving marine sloth. We've all heard of giant frito giant sloths, but in Peru, there's this um, marine sloth that's in this image. So the narwhal of Axel Heiberg is spectacular, splendid uh, Canadian fossil number one. And now I'm gonna jump down to the Houghton astroblem on Devon Island. Devon Island is the island in the bottom there. And an astroblem is an asteroid impact crater. And here's a map of Devon and that little round dot is where an asteroid struck. And it was a big asteroid. It was able to punch through several thousand feet of layered rocks and made a huge crater that's about 20 kilometers wide. And you can see it on Google Earth. Here's a, a good aerial view. It's like a giant blister on the planet. You note that sort of grayish layer in the middle of the bullseye. That's the center of the lake. We can see the ring goes out beyond that. And when an asteroid strikes, it punches a very deep hole. In this case, the hole was at least 4,000 to 5,000 feet deep. Then there's a rebound, which causes the rocks to spring back up. And the bedrock here in the center part of Devon Island is Paleozoic limestone. But if you walk in the middle of the crater, there is granite from the basement rock that's 3,000 feet deeper that was brought to the surface in the rebound. And the granite's been blown full of air. So you can pick up big chunks of it carried around like movie star rocks because the asteroid impact shocked the rock and brought it to the surface. Here's an oblique photograph of the Haston Astroblem taken by Martin Littman from the helicopter. And you can see that same gray patch in the middle and make out this gigantic like view that looks like a sliced red onion almost. And when you make a gigantic hole in the ground in a place that's wet, rain falls into the hole and you have a lake. And when you have a lake, sediment accumulates in the lake and you have a fossil making machine. That's how fossils get made. And much of the Canadian Arctic doesn't have fossils because the old rock exposed to the surface is not providing a place where fossils can accumulate. But in this particular case, the lake which was formed about 25 million years ago became a place to sample fossils from the Arctic. And there's no other good 20 to 25 million year old fossil site anywhere in the Arctic of the entire world. So here's a single sample where we can get a glimpse into what the Arctic looked like 20 to 25 million years ago. I keep saying 20 to 25. We dated the original date at about 23 using fission track. There've been several other argon-argon dates, but it's all looking like about a early Miocene lake was formed. There's about 48 meters of lake bed sediments in the middle. And that's sort of the tan stuff that's in the middle of the gray. And it was this site that uh, we went to first in 84, then in 85, and on and on. You can see the gray hills in the background. That's the eject that was blown out of the crater. And this place really does feel like you're on Mars. There's even fewer plants here than there are most places in the Arctic. And after we did research here, a number of um, uh, space organizations actually started using hot Astroblem as a practice site for the Martian rover thing, because it's like one of the closest places on planet Earth to being on Mars. But fortunately, there's life at uh, hot Astroblem. You can find these gigantic weird rock structures, which are called shatter cones. These are what form when asteroids hit limestone. And they're very distinctive rock features uh, that are basically shock features embedded in the rock that are demonstrable evidence that it was an asteroid impact. And this was first, the site was first published by Ray Thor Steinson in the 70s. It was uh, mapped as an asteroid impact, and that's what it is. It's a beautiful, big asteroid impact. And I spent much of my career studying asteroid impacts, uh, looking at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary and what happened to the dinosaurs and plants when the asteroid struck in the Chicxulub. But here's a smaller impact, 
Remember the one in um, Chicxulub impact in the Yucatan is about 180 kilometers in diameter. This one's about 20 kilometers in diameter. Much smaller impact, no obvious extinction associated with it, but this one's job was to make a hole in the ground, which became a lake, which became a fossil machine. And you can see there's uh, Leo and Mary watching me do all the work since I was a young guy having to dig all the holes. Um, we're digging in the lake bed sediments, and you can see off in the distance the gray slopes of the, uh, the debris flows, um, and you can see the streams washing through this really otherworldly sort of exposure. And here's Mary, uh, again, in the posture of a vertebrate paleontologist with Rob Schock from Boston College now, um, looking for and finding vertebrate fossils. So not only are there plants, there's vertebrate fossils. And of course, Leo and I were there for the leaves, and... Um, Mary is there for the vertebrates. And here's on the left, a modern rabbit skull viewed from the pallet view. And on the right, a Miocene rabbit skull from Hot and Asterblem. And Mary collected many of these rabbit skulls. And she and I kept joking about, you know, what causes so many rabbits to be in one place. And uh, we'll get back to that. But she also found some really other interesting fossils. She found um, what is a, is a, a small, a large toothed deer like animal called a chevrotan or a tragulus. It lives in the Philippines today. And Mary found uh, bones of an animal quite similar to this tragulus, which is really quite weird. I mean, a, um, a tragulate in the Arctic is uh, really would like to see more specimens, but it was a very interesting fossil. She also found larger specimens of um, uh, another prisodactyl, which I won't talk about in this talk, but also um, some moles and shrews some fish and some birds. So it's a sort of interesting little fauna. And um, we found exactly one leaf fossil. You, you never find just one leaf fossil. Usually when you find leaf fossils like potato chips, you can't have just one, there's thousands of them. Anybody who's collected leaf fossils know you find one, you're gonna find another one. We found one leaf fossil on hot and astral. After weeks and weeks of searching, one leaf fossil, this fossil birch leaf, not a spectacular return. And we, Leo and I were suitably shamed by finding, and it wasn't even complete, it's a half a leaf fossil. Fortunately for us, we did find little patches of vegetation in little blebs in the lake bed silts. And from these, we were able to sort out a variety of nuts, fruits, and seeds, and also pollen grains. And so we did get things like this beautifully preserved cones of conifers. And at the end of the day, uh, the flora of the formation includes pine, spruce, hemlock, larch, cedar, heath, and hazelnuts, birch, alders, elms, sweet gums, sycamores, maples, walnuts, wingnuts, hickories, and holly. So it's sort of the kind of florist you would be seeing somewhere down in Quebec, probably. Quebec or down into the border side. So it's a, um, a nice forest, unlike what it is today. And um, here's a snapshot of two trees that were living at hot and astroblem 23 million years ago. On the left is liquid ambar, the beautiful um, fall foliage liquid ambar, and on the right, um, various kinds of larch and tamaracks trees, which um, were growing there. And here's a view of an alien. This is sort of my view of what looking across the hot and astroblem lake would have looked like 20 million years ago. Just looking across this lake at the distant ridges with um, some overhanging alders in this space. Now, um, here is a drawing that Cliff did for Mary, because Mary and I kept joking about the lake must have been floating mats of stinking bunny carcasses, because there were so many rabbit skulls. So that you see in the foreground are these floating mats of dead stinking bunnies. Uh, there's a new project underway right now, and there'll be some new uh, illustrations coming of this one. So this is a little bit primitive for your illustrations of Houghton. And I went on to do other things, but 22 years later, we left Houghton in 1985, 22 years later, Mary Dawson was still working at Hot and Astroblem. So here's Mary Dawson in 2007, um, epic. And she was epic when she started working in the Arctic in the 70s, but she was still working in the Arctic in 2007. And just um, amazing work there. Here she is at Hot and Astroblem. And this time she had Natalie Rubinsky, uh, <laughs> Rubinsky who is at the um, National Museum in Ottawa. And Natalie, Natalia and Mary worked very closely. You can see on their little table there are the remains of lots of little um, hot and astrobem fossils. And remarkably, they found this, a complete skeleton 
an amazing complete skeleton. It's, you know, as fossil vertebrates go, when you find a skeleton like this, you can't believe it. Now it took them three years because at hot when you find something, um, the lake beds are, the silts are, they're very fine. They're not lithified at all. You can scrape them with a knife, but you get down one foot and you hit the permafrost and it's like a layer of concrete. So if a skeleton is coming out of the ground, you can dig right down to the permafrost layer and then you're stopped. You can't excavate anymore. So what you do is you excavate what you can get that year, clear off the space, come back the next year, take another bite, one lower. And it's taken, in some cases, as many as four years to get a complete skeleton out of the ground there. But here's the skeleton that Natalia and Mary got between 2007 and 2010. And you can see from its jaws on the left that it's a carnivore of some sort, but it was an unknown taxon. It was a new genus and species, which um, is mounted here. This is the mount that's at the National Museum in Ottawa. The name that was given to it was Puigila Darwini, named after Charles Darwin. And it was published in Nature um, by Nat Natalia, Mary, and Richard Dick Tedford in 2009, a semi-aquatic Arctic mammalian carnivore from the Miocene epoch and the origin of the pinnipedia. So this is pretty cool. Here's an animal that was living an otter-like lifestyle, but it was less otter-like, and I could even move around on land better than otters could, but had a number of anatomical features that put it down very close to the base of the pinniped tree. And in fact, here's a, um, another mounted skeleton of this thing. And in this slide, Natalia says, a relative of seals, sea lions, and walrus. Don't anyone I hear walrus speaking? And uh, in, a, in a paper that was published just um, two years ago by Ryan Patterson and Natalia, um, you can see the chart on the bottom where over there, the right, the blue word Puigila puts Puigila Darwini at the very base of the lineage that eventually goes on to create seals, sea lions, and walruses. So now I've given you two examples of how the discovery of a single fossil leaf can lead to a walrus-like organism. I'll move on to ammonites now. In uh, 1993, I, I visited Phil Curry up at the Royal Trail Museum of Paleontology. And uh, Phil's always been uh, one of my heroes. I think that the work he does is phenomenal. I think the Royal Trail Museum is one of the great museums of the world and their close connection to the Dinosaur Park um, Formation and the Horseshoe Canyon Formation, the scholar has created this amazing collection of fossils um, and an amazing team of people doing the work. And I, I forgot what the exact reason to go up to um, Alberta was in 1993, but I know that it included a field trip to Dinosaur Provincial Park. And, Phil complained to me that although you could find dinosaurs all over the place, fossil plants were really very difficult to find. He said, in fact, there's not even a single good fossil leaf site in the park. And I'm like, that, that can't be the case. I said, let me, let me go, let me loose. Let me see if I can find something. So we drove out there in 1993 and uh, we're driving on the road and I see an outcrop and I go, there, stop the car. And I ran up the hill, it was about halfway up the hill, took one whack of the pickaxe and popped out a fossil leaf and brought it back down to Phil Curry. And he was like, no way. You didn't just do that. I'm like, no, no, I'm a leaf finding machine. That's what I do. <laughs> and so we carried on the field trip and Phil said, look, next summer, come back. You can dig that fossil site out and you can find other fossil sites for us. So we came back the next summer, a motley crew indeed. There's Dennis Brayman on the left. Dennis is the pollenologist from the Royal Trail Museum. In the middle is Peter Lang from London, who was at the time um, working with me and studying the insect damage on fossil leaves from the Hill Creek Formation. And on the right, my um, longtime hardened field assistant, Peter Bucknam. And the three, the three of us, uh, the three of those and I went around the park. First, we went to the site where we found the fossil leaf. And you can see it here. And what catches my eye is the rapid variations in lithology from sand to silt to sand to silt. Um, there. And this site turned out to be quite a nice fossil plant quarry, actually. You can see it's cracking away here. And note, um, it, right at the base of the thick out, there's sort of a whitish sandstone, and below that is a leaf layer. You can see leaves coming out of the rock quite nicely. And these are big, beautiful leaves. Um, for not having any fossil leaves at Dennis Air Park, we rectified that problem quite nicely with this one quarry. A diversity of leaves, very typical of that time period. This is about 75 million years ago. 
Um, we have a number of these Campanian fossil sites in Montana, Wyoming, uh, Colorado, Utah. So we, we kind of have a sense of what the Campanian flora looks like. And there were no real surprises here in terms of the species. It wasn't particularly diverse, but the preservation was good. But you get a number of different kinds of sycamore relatives here. Um, you can see, you can tell any fossil I click because I will actually use it, the air scribes to expose the petioles in every case. And look, look for petioles. If you don't, if you see a petiole, it's probably a fossil that I've collected because the fossil, when you find a fossil leaf, the leaf makes a, um, leaf is rotted away. The leaf makes a leaf shaped hole in the rocks. When you split the rock, it wants to split where the leaf is. But when the, um, the weakness of the rock narrows down, either the tip of the leaf or the petiole, the rock won't split on the petiole. So you have to use an air scribe to prepare out the leaves, uh, the tips of the leaves, the margins of the leaves, and the petioles. It's an important feature to be able to uh, actually use vertebrate paleontology preparation techniques to work and expose leaf fossils. Here's a couple of different types of things. And it can be right, you can see not metasequoia, but a relative of metasequoia, probably more of a true sequoia, and a couple of other leaves that are not cercidophyllum, but ancestral relatives of cercidophyllum. On the left, here's a, um, a very lobe-leafed ginkgo. And ginkgo typically has very tough cuticle, which peels off of the rocks. It's still there. Like most leaves run away, but it's very typical to crack up on a rock where you find a ginkgo leaf, and the leaf will blow away in the breeze. And that's what this one is doing on the left-hand side. The fossil on the right-hand side is a little bit more subtle. To some of you, it might look like a caterpillar. It's, in fact, an aquatic root. Some plants have are aquatic plants which don't root in soil. They float in water, and their roots hang down. And they have a they have very um, large central root, and then these very fine hair-like rootlets that proceed off that. And what we had indeed found was a fossil that I knew well. It's this very odd-looking fossil. If you look at the leaf foundation, this will not remind you of any living plant. It's a wholly unique, Cretaceous-only plant that was discovered in the 1870s in Wyoming, named by Leo Lecaro in 1876 as Pistia corrugata. Now, Pistia is the living water lettuce. And um, I didn't think much about this plant, um, except to say, boy, when I find it, I know it because it's so distinctive. These round leaves, they have sort of like a little, um, a little bit of a rim around the side as well. Um, and they, when they fossil, if you look at the bottom of this one, for instance, see how the veins at the base of the leaf that is labeled 16 are not covered by leaf tissue? What's going on there? Where do you get a leaf where the veins don't have leaf tissue on them? And it took me a while to realize that these leaves were actually inflated because they float on the water. The inflated leaf lets them float, but when they fossilize, sediment gets inside the leaf, the leaf sort of pulls apart, pulling the veins out. And it took us years to figure this out, but it turns out that um, these things show up in Campanian rocks all the way from Wyoming up to Alaska. No, sorry, Wyoming up to Alberta. Here's a, um, an image of the type specimen from Point of Rocks, Wyoming, collected in 1876 by Lecro. And if you look at the one on the right, you can see the same thing where the leaf tissue is slid off the veins. That's a very characteristic feature of this to see. And on the one on the left, you can see the rim around the leaf that forms. And these things are quite distinctive and quite recognizable. What was amazing though, and here's one that I collected in North Dakota in the Hell Creek Formation. So these things range from the Campanian to the Maastrichtian. You can see the rim around the leaf. You can see the, um, this beautiful, crazy venation pattern. If you look at the leaf on top, there's actually two different vein patterns. There's the vein pattern of the bottom of the leaf and the vein pattern of the top of the leaf because it's an inflated leaf, so it has a top and a bottom. So when you're splitting rocks, this is really weird. Don't when you split a leaf fossil, you get, the, you get a one part of the split has the bottom of the leaf, one has the top of the leaf. But when you dig these things, you have the bottom of the bottom, the top of the bottom, the bottom of the top, and the top of the top. So there's four different possible ways to get a vein pattern on one of these leaves. And like I said, it took me a long time to figure this out, but we figured it out, we did. But the site, uh, and here's modern water lettuce, and you'll notice that these things have very clear, distinct venation, which is not, not at all like the leaves I was showing you. So the name Pistia is not a good name for this thing. And I realized we've got a new thing. We've got to name this new thing. Um, here's modern Pistia. And two things to note about modern Pistia. The leaves in this case are not inflated, but the stems are inflated. That's what floats. The plants are connected by a solid green stem called a stolon. 
And then hanging off from the bottoms of the leaves are the aquatic leaf uh, roots that you saw on the Cabinia, uh, the, um, the ones from the Denisor Park. So the fossil had many similarities with Pistia, but it wasn't Pistia. It had stolons, it had roots, but we really got home with this when we found this specimen. This is from Denisor Provincial Park at that site. And you can see very clearly the stolons, the aquatic roots, and the leaves of the rims around them. So here we had an entire plant. And in paleobotany, it's super rare to find a whole plant. You usually find a leaf or a branch or a twig or a seed. But with aquatic plants, you have a fighting chance because the whole plant is floating. You bury the whole plant, you get it. So here we have a complete Pistia corrugata plant, which was great. So I started working with Ruth Stocky and Guy Rothwell, and we did the work to figure out what these things looked like. We reconstructed them. You can see that crazy pattern and you can see in cross section how the leaves have uh, or inflated so they have a lower part and an upper part the lower part and the upper part have different venation patterns which is uh, took us a long time to figure out and here's a, a uh, nice reconstruction of this thing um, so here's your connection to ammonites i wanted to name a genus after somebody i respected an awful lot and probably nobody fit the bill better than bill cobbin the great ammonite collector from the U.S. Geological Survey. Bill Cobbin died at the age of nine, 99 um, in 2014 after working for the USGS for 70 years. And he, when I visited him in his office one time in Denver and said, Bill, I know you keep good records. How many ammonite fossil sites have you located in your career? He said, just over 14,000. And his collection an amazing, incredibly well curated collection was at the USGS in Denver when the USGS um, closed the paleontology and stratigraphy branch in 1993. So it was an orphaned collection of over a million ammonites, which um, I knew when I took this job in DC that I would get that collection to safekeeping in the Smithsonian. And we just finished that this job last spring. 23 tractor trailer trucks full of ammonites are now in a brand new collection facility at Suitland in Washington, D.C. And if you ever want to see an amazing ammonite collection, come see that. So this is a way that one leaf tickets to an ammonite as opposed to a walrus. And my homage to Bill Cobbin with the name Cobania corrugata, because the name Pistia refers to a living genus, which this is not. So it's the same species, corrugata, from Leckero, but with the new genus epithet, Cobania, after Bill Cobbin, my ammonite hero. Now, 2002, I went to work with uh, on a Chinese Russian team on the Chinese Russian borderland near Jiayin in China. That's where the arrow on the left is here. And um, we were looking at Campanian and rocks there. And I cannot tell you how delighted I was to find the first Asian Cobania. I found that actual fossil. It's known only from Alberta, Wyoming, Montana, and Utah. We found it in right on the China-Russia border and this outcrop along the side of the hill. And this is the Amur River, which separates China from Russia. That's Russia on the right, China on the left. And on the right, the year after we found um, Cobania in China, our colleagues in Russia found Cobania in Russia. And that specimen on the right is a Russian Cobania. So here's yet another example of the Bering Land Bridge in operation, in this case, 76 years ago. Now, meanwhile, back at Denisor Provincial Park, I had really kind of embarrassed Dennis Brayman by finding, Dennis, finding plant fossils in Dinosaur Provincial Park where he would not. He was, he was a fossil plant curator at the Trail Museum. And that I know made him feel um, a little bit sad. Um, he was happy we found the site. And after we left, he took a team, uh, he and Dennis Ellenbach took a team back to the, to the um, site to collect more specimens for the Royal Trail Museum because the site was good, it was producing fossils. I'd taken a number of fossils to Denver on loan. They all went back to the Trail Museum, but he wanted to make some collections there. And um, they started jackhammering through Overburden and uh, Dennis was running the jackhammer and they noticed a small brown fragmentary fossil at the tip of the jackhammer and realized it was fossil bone, which is not good for them because it meant the quarry digging had to stop. Phil Curry and his career to come in and inspect to see what they had found. And what they found was a showstopper. You can see in the ground there, a perfect skull of an anathemimus. Uh, and they, the jackhammer mark was very, it was right where you see the base of the neck preserved right there. They jackhammered the neck of an anathemimus. And uh, 
It was a really nice undistorted skull. And many of you have seen this fossil because this is the, um, here's the actual field shot of that skull, an exquisite thing. The necks attached to the skull, the vertebrae go all the way down. Took, took Phil um, several days with the exacto knife to expose this really exquisite specimen. What's so amazing was that the rest of it was there too. So you've all seen this specimen. This is Ornithomimus edmontonicus. It's on display in the Royal Trail Museum when you walk in. This specimen was found at the bottom of a fossil leaf quarry. Would never have been found were it not for the fossil leaf quarry. And uh, here's the mount as you see it in the Royal Terrell. And what's cool is this is really one of the finest dinosaurs ever found in North America for its completeness. So it's missing a few bones, but not many. It's got the entire gastralia, the belly ribs intact. And it's got the classic arched back um, neck pose of a lot of small dinosaurs. But what's really cool about this, um, there was a book published, um, described the discovery and re reconstruction of this thing. Uh, it talks about the fact that it was in fact a leaf quarry that led to this discovery. And here is an uh, image by Marge Leggett that I commissioned of the Ornithomimus perusing the Cobania. The, uh, the smart, one of the smart dinosaurs taking a good long look at a good Cretaceous plant fossil growing here in a pond. And of course, um, in 2012 then, uh, Darla Zelenitsky at the Terrell realized that the arm bones of this animal actually had the scar marks of long shafted feathers. So this is a, an example of a feathered dinosaur, one of the first direct bits of evidence for feathered dinosaurs in North America. There was a subsequent paper in 2016 by Anne Aaron van der Riest based on a second um, ornithomimid from Dinosaur Park that had much more abundant feathers preserved around the specimen. That paper is 2016 Cretaceous Research. So here's Julius Sistoni's uh, reconstruction of the ornithomimus. We like to call it the Cobania ornithomimus, um, found in Dinosaur Park. And you know, of course, once artists start painting um, feathers and colors, there's a fair amount of options they have in the world. There's a second image by Julius um, showing another way that this animal might have looked. And it's just fun for me to imagine the whole story here, this plant um, animal combination and the story of this animal having feathers. So that's my third splendid Canadian fossil. And I'll end with just uh, a couple of advertisements. I invite you all to come to Washington, D.C. to see the David H. Coke Hall of Fossils, Deep Time, which opened in June 8th of 2019. It's 30,000 square foot exhibit that takes you from the beginning of life on Earth to the present and into the future, because we are humans and humans are part of the story of planet Earth. And we're um, driving the planet down. As we say, humans are the asteroid, humans are geology. It's time for us to think about how we manage this planet. So come see Deep Time. I also will welcome you to see Gary Staub's new spectacular Megalodon. We built a life-size Megalodon to hover over our um, cafeteria. And what's amazing about the Megalodon, it's 52 feet long. Um, it's larger than it looks in this image because um, it's quite a ways away from the people who are standing in front of it. From the belly to the base of the dorsal fin is 14 feet. It's larger than a humpback whale. Its wet weight would have been about 59 tons. And what I am so charmed by is that Washington DC lies in Miocene sediments and we find Megalodon teeth. And where this animal is hanging in the museum is the precise location where it could have been swimming in the Miocene. <laughs> I also wanna um, alert you to Polar Extremes uh, and the show I did for Nova that aired in, in February of 2020. You can stream it by typing in Nova Polar Extremes on Google, it's a two hour long show about the uh, polar forest. You can see we went back to those same petrified forests that I went to with Mary Dawson back in 1984. We actually relocated the same forest that I showed you before and a great shot. And then I finally, I'll end with this one. Upcoming in April of this year, I'm just finishing up a um, Nova show about the, the Ice Age footprint discovery in New Mexico of human footprints in association with mammoths, giant sloths and bison 23,000 years before the present. You can see the human footprints in the foreground by the trench there. And what's so amazing is that you can see we've, we found a place where the trend, where the footprints go into the hills. So there's layers above. We can get radiometric dates above and below the footprints. But as they were digging the trench to select the carbon-14 dates, they found five more levels that had human footprints in them. 
Think about this. If you're digging through layered rocks and you dig below, you don't expect to find fossils at every level, but there were five levels of human footprints that ranged between 23 and 21,000 years ago in this New Mexico site. It's now the oldest human site in North America or the Americas. And there are literally thousands of human footprints at this site. So this Nova Show airs in April. With that, I will thank um, my friends from the first expedition, Mary, Cliff, and Leo, from, from the team from um, Hot and Astro and Natalia and team at Ottawa, and the team from the Royal Trail Museum at the Dinosaur Provincial Park. And of course, the great artists, Lipman, Leggett, Stoney, Ray Troll, Wes Weir, Gary Staub. And thank you, Heidi. Thank you. Well, with that, um, that was a hugely rewarding and engaging talk, Kirk. So thank you for that. Um, as well as those PBS uh, um, projects, which I'll put the links on uh, Kirk's page and leave it up. He also did Visions of the Lost Worlds, the paleo art of Jay Matt Matterns uh, three years ago. COVID's changed my brain. 2018 maybe, something like okay. that, yeah. And Trees Are Made of Gas, the story of carbon and climate, which I believe was last year, yes? Yep. So those, we'll add those links as well. So this is the tricky part where we ask for questions um, if you take your cursor for those watching and bring it to the lower part of the screen, you can click raise hand. Well, not raise hand, but not raise trolls, but it says mm -hmm. raised hand. <laughs> Otherwise, you can put the questions in the chat and we can see if we can make this work. This works lovely when there's just a few people. It's chaos if we unmute, but we could also risk um, uh, we could also risk unmuting you. So if if somebody speaks over you, if you have a question, you can, um, if you stop, then their question will come forward. So um, Casey Burns, unmute yourself. You're up to bat. Yeah, I've had a question, Kirk. Um, um, these modern meta sequoias, are those considered the same species that we find in the past? Or... Yeah, they're pretty indistinguishable, Casey. I mean, you could find almost identical anatomy. So. They may not be, but they haven't changed much at all. Okay. And there are, there's lots and lots of related um, Cupressaceae, like in that family, there's a whole bunch of these different things that are occur in the Cretaceous, Paleocene, and Eocene. And it's really sort of the Eocene when we start seeing genuine metasequoias. There's lots of parataxodiums, taxodiums, pre, pre sequoias. Um, and, and uh, but the uh, metasequoia has got a very distinctive leaf phyllotaxy and it's got a very distinctive cone structure. And we find those things happily at Republic and elsewhere. When, when you and Ray stopped here, um, did you notice the metasequoia right by our driveway, right where you parked? I, I, wherever I go, I notice every tree that I see, Casey. Good, good. <laughs> Thank you, Kirk. Good, Derek Larson, you're up to bat. Hello, Kirk. Great talk. I greatly appreciate it. I don't know if uh, we've met in person before, but I'm the uh, collections manager at the uh, uh, Royal BC Museum um, oh, and a former uh, uh, grad student of Phil Curry. So I was actually the person who found the ornithomimid specimen that Van der Rees described. So, oh, nice. Yeah, Excellent. so I, I, I appreciated that. Um, so I've got a question. I, I love the uh, Cobania ornithomimid quarry story. It, it, I've heard it many different times now and it, it's always great. Uh, but I was wondering, having worked in Dinosaur Park and not found many plants, um, when you're looking at Cobania, I've never even seen a, a fossil in person. Like how how big is it? Like what sort of range of leaves are, do you find? And like, what are you looking for when you're out looking in Dinosaur Park for plants? Well, so, so two separate questions. Um, one is looking for plants and one is Cobania. You know, we, that summer of 1994, when we went and looked for fossil plants, I thought, you know, it was like taking candy from a baby to find that first site. It was hard to find any of their sites. But fossil plant sites really are rare at Dinosaur Provincial Park. And um, we found about five other sites, but none of them were that great. And the way you look for fossil plant sites is with a pickaxe, because you can never find them by looking for them. You can see different patterns in the stratigraphy that sometimes are suggestive, but the only way to look is to actually split rocks along bedding planes. And so we walk around with a pickaxe and dig hundreds of holes. And Phil gave us license to walk around and dig hundreds of holes. And we did walk around and dig hundreds of holes. 
And it was very disheartening, actually. We found, like I say, four or five sites, but the first one was the best one. And um, I, I still, you know, I, what I usually like to do is to get somebody who is young and strong and totally unaware of anything and say, go dig holes, because they don't know where to dig. I have a bias of where I dig, but if I can get like a teenage boy, 70 year old strong boy who could dig holes all day long, I say, just dig holes anywhere you want. So I sort of need the random number generation to just to look everywhere. Because we've we've learned is that fossil plants show up in unpredicted places and you'll never find them unless you dig those holes. And of course, um, if you're a land manager, you might, and you like the shape of your hoodoos, you don't like paleobotanists because we run around and chop holes in your hoodoos. But that's the only way to find the fossils. Um, so I'm, I, I do hope that um, at some point in time, the Royal Trail turns loose a herd of 17 year old boys with pickaxes and girls too, because they can dig really well as well. Um, and just obliterates that place and finds more fossil sites. As for Cobanias, the little ones are about an inch, the big ones are around four inches. So it's a pretty range. Um, I, we've subsequently named a second species, Cobania hickii, after Leo Hickey, based on a site in South Dakota. And um, so it looks like it's a really cool, cool plan. We have, you know, we're finding lots more of these really interesting. Um, aquatic plants and, and I'm working now on a picking the Hell Creek formation apart and sort of trying to illustrate the lakes, the rivers, the levees, the floodplains, the back swamps, so like the different places of the Hell Creek formation where I've, Hell Creek is where I've specialized in most of my time and I've been working on that now. I've got about 200 quarries that have produced fossil leaves in the Hell Creek formation, about 400 species. So it's a much richer view. It's probably the richest view of any Cretaceous vegetation anywhere in the world. Awesome. Julius, you're up to bat on mute and hello you. Uh, wonderful talk, Kirk. That was just fascinating. And it's always been a huge pleasure to work with you and your team. Um, and so I, I'm curious, you, um, in the Dinosaur Park formation, I imagine that, sorry, I'm not sure if you can hear me better now. Uh, in the Dinosaur Park formation, um, I imagine that you've probably also worked uh, either in collaboration or uh, at arm's length with um, Ava Kupel, who's uh, at, with in, in terms of her work in palynology. I'm wondering how your discovery and those of others after you as well in dinosaur park formation of the, the, the body plants of, Lee, uh, of, you know, of plants, yeah. the body fossils of plants um, has changed the impression of the plant community and the dinosaur park formation compared to the, the pollen record, basically, in terms of either the species composition or the relative abundance of types or what? That's a really good question, Julius. And thank you for the use of your images. You do amazing work. Uh, you know, I, much of my career, I worked very closely with a, with a now a deceased palynologist named Doug Nichols. And Doug Nichols um, was the US counterpart uh, to Art Sweet, who was the famous Alberta polynologist and Art Sweet worked closely with Dennis Brayman, who was at the Trail Museum. So Art, Dennis, and Doug Nichols were sort of the three world's experts on Cretaceous polynology. And Doug and I um, worked together closely from 1986 until he passed away in 2009 and did a book together called uh, Plants in the QT Boundary, a global summary of vegetation of the QT Boundary. So I spent a lot of time with uh, Doug and of course then much less time with Dennis and Art, but quite a bit of time with them as well. And what's very interesting is, is by the time you get back to the Cretaceous, the pollen grains are not attributable to the plant leaf species. Like if you're looking in the Eocene, for instance, you find a fossil sycamore leaf, you'll find sycamore pollen. You say, well, I've seen a modern sycamore. I know what sycamore pollen looks like. And the only way you can really tell in a fossil thing that is an in an extinct genus, if the pollen goes with the leaf, is you actually find the leaf attached to a branch, attached to a stem, attached to a flower, and you take the pollen out of the flower and compare the pollen directly to the leaf. So in the Cretaceous, the plant record is divided into two pieces. There's the pollen record and the leaf record. And the leaves themselves are hard to identify two species. So neither the pollen nor the leaves get you to the plant family. So you basically have two independent parallel records of the vegetation. The leaves show you what the place looked like. And they also tell you about the climate of the, of the site. The pollen tells you a different story. The pollen tells you 
how many different things were there at a single site? Because a single chip of mud might give you 10,000 pollen grains. You can count them all you want and get a large number of specimens. But this was an interesting fact. If you look in modern botany, pollen is more generalized than leaves. That is to say that oak pollen looks like oak pollen, but there are many, many different kinds of oak species and many different kinds of oak leaves. So for one type of pollen, you might get 20 kinds of species of leaves. And that's what Doug and I found in the Hill Creek. At the end of the day, he looked at over a million pollen grains and got 100 different species. I looked at about 40,000 leaves and got 400 species. Wow. So, so I think this is one of the great, you put your finger right on top of the key problem of Cretaceous paleobotany is pollenologists and paleobotanists have a very hard time talking to each other. Both, both are really good tools. Pollenology is excellent for microstratigraphy and for getting species counts and localities. But remember, pollen blows around too. Mm -hmm. um, but, and it's really good, you know, we use pollen to precisely put our finger on the Cretaceous tertiary boundary because we lose 40% of the pollen species at the millimeter that's marked by the iridium anomaly. Wow. So we have a real good indicator. So I always just say that like, I couldn't live without Doug Nichols. He couldn't live without me. And the same thing applies to Eva Koppelhaus and Art Sweet and Dennis Brayman. And what Canada has really not had is a Cretaceous paleobotanist who, who's been digging into this Canadian floras um, and trying to figure out the, the leaf side of the story. Mm -hmm. So it, it is frustrating because um, we've done a lot of work and we should know more than we know, um, but we don't and it, wow. it's ongoing. And so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's um, still room for lots of good students to come into this mix and really tackle it. I, my other colleague I mentioned before is um, Ruth Stocky and Gar Rothwell. They also work on the Appian Way floor in Vancouver Island where the fossils are preserved in concretions like the crabs, and they can get three-dimensional cross-section. They work mainly on fruits, seeds, and cones. And those organisms have lots of characteristics. They can do a pretty good job of putting them into a botanical affinity. Nice. So they can good, you know, they're making a really good process with, um, with those fossils. Yeah, I had a, a chance to um, interact a bit with Ruth Stocky uh, when she was at the U of A. Uh, really nice collection she had there as well. So yeah, but I hope, you, as you say, you get more students in this field in Canada. Thank you. You bet. Thank you, Julius. That was a, a, a perfect question and one I had on my mind. Thomas Vulcan, you are up to bat. Hey, Kirk. Thanks for the talk. Thanks. Always love looking at your old photos of Stone Rose uh, <laughs> in Republic and wanted to make sure everybody knew that they can actually dig at Stone Rose. It's a scientific research site and it uh, opens up in the spring. So at the weekend of April 22nd is our opening members only weekend. So that's great. My question to you would be plant and animal fossils together. Mm -hmm. At Stone Rose, we find the plants. At, at Green River Formation, you find uh, uh, animals. What, what's the interplay between being able to find plant and animal fossils in the same locality? So, um, you know, Stone Rose and um, the sites at Princeton, BC, the Green River Formation, some of our big Paleocene sites in Patagonia, um, the summer sites in Europe are fossil lake beds. And fossil lake beds are also the, all the great lounging sites, the Cretaceous lounging sites in China are also lake bed sites. And in lake beds, you get abundant plants, often abundant insects, and occasional birds and mammals and fish as well, depending on the setting. So, you, you know, it's, I would say that it all comes down to the volume of rock you move through because in the Green River Formation, you don't find mammals very often. You find them very rarely, but you move, they're moving so much rock there to find the fossil fish. Mm -hmm. you know, they probably look at a, a thousand square meters of, of rock surface before they find a fossil mammal. When they find one, they found the rare thing. If at Republic you were moving that kind of volume of rock, you'd probably find your Eocene mammal or your Eocene bird. And I keep hoping that that's going to happen. You found a few fish. I think, do you have some salamanders or something like that? Do you have any amphibians? Yeah, we have a, a, a bird fossil, a smashed bird fossil. Yeah, yeah like in Republic, yeah, Florissant is the same way. And we, um, while I was at Denver, we got two really nice birds from Florissant. So, I mean, I think it's just a matter of time. To, you know, things are falling in the lakes, they sink to the bottom, they fossilize, and they're just rare. It's a rare thing to find a whole horse or a whole bird or a whole lizard, but they're going to be there. There'll be a day when you find a mammal at Stone Rose. I have a personal goal of a bat. 
That would be good. <laughs> they must have been well, flying around bats. there eating the insects, right? Well, they're, they're, they're bats in Green River, they're bats in Messel. Um, so, you know, there's, there had to be bats there. It's just a matter of splitting enough rock. Thanks, Kurt. You bet. I'm hoping for you to find that as well, Thomas. Casey, you're up to bat. Actually, in some of our uh, formations along the Straits of Juan de Fuca, the fish formation, um, we have fossil animals in abundance in, the, in all the various smallest and crabs and fossil whales. Um, we also at this one locality where I find a very nice starfish logger shot and have, have uh, several different species of fossil leaves. Um, and another thing that we find in this formation are, are a couple of large flightless birds called flatopterids that Jim mm -hmm. Geddard has found. Um, some of these are found in Japan and they stand like nine feet tall and they look like cormorants and stuff. So, uh, so when they're just sitting on the seashore, um, you know, it's just something to ponder. So, so in, when you're out looking at, at, uh, um, you know, stuff that, that deposited in the ocean, you know, um, Keep your search image open for uh, both leaves and uh, and fossil birds. So. You know, that's I got my sort of cut my teeth on, on the Olympic Peninsula stuff and I had sites where you could find pine cones and leaves and nautiluses and whales and crabs in the concretions. So these near coast kind of things um, are great places that get a little bit of surf and turf. Yeah, our current interpretation of this one particular site is uh, since we're finding a lot of uh, shallow water mixed with a lot of deep water is that it's something like similar to what's at the bottom of the Astoria Canyon. Yeah, so that's a, that's a long way to take a bird, but you could probably do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, Jim's been finding skulls and, you know, various leg parts and stuff in that type of material. Yeah. So, so yeah. and a lot of these are aquatic birds. They sink to the bottom just like the whales do and stuff sometimes. And speaking of whales, hey, Ken. Hello, Ken. I'm going to say one comment and then and then you can unmute yourself, Ken. Um, I can't remember the year, maybe 2006, but there was a big slide in Sumas, a bunch of uh, beautiful leaves, Eocene leaves. It was George Musto who did some mold. I ah. think. Kent, I don't know if you were there that day. And a bunch of shorebird tracks and huge diatrima tracks, big bird tracks, all yeah. in association. It's the only time I've seen them associated. Um, Kent, you're welcome to unmute. Okay, hey Kirk, you know, regarding that uh, Pelagorna skull I found last year, did you ever get a chance to look through your collection and see if there was any others? No, I haven't, you know, we've been, uh, I don't know where to look for that actually. I need to, now that we're back in the collections and I can get Nick and uh, Bahaska to look for those stuff. Is it, I, I, was, I was in the museum alone for 461 days, which is awesome. And I pulled a lot of drawers, but I didn't know exactly which drawers to, uh -huh. to pull those. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to start thinking seriously about having my collection curated or something. The University of Oregon is kind of interested in some of it, but I don't know if I wanted everything to go there or maybe some more donations to uh, Smithsonian there. Well, we're always happy to get your stuff. I mean, Kent found an amazing, we, Ray and I met Kent at a uh, talk we gave in Lincoln City and he showed up holding an incredible billfish skull that weighed about 60 pounds, found on the same beach that a nearly identical skull was found by Doug M. Long back in the 60s. It was an amazing two billhead beach would be the name of that beach, not Mulak Beach. <laughs> That's good, uh, Dan Bowen, you're up to bat and hello you. Oops, you're muted still, Dan. Bottom left. Yeah, hey. thanks, Kurt. Um, Dan Bowen from the uh, Vancouver Island Paleontological Society. I don't think we've met. <clears throat> I'm also the chair of the BCPA, which is over uh, arching all the societies in British Columbia. And we have all kinds of great things going on. But specifically, I wanted just to ask a question about um, the um, the uh, fossil toothed whales that were found on the west coast of uh, Vancouver Island in the intertidal area that the Smithsonian came up, I believe, to extract about five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have any updates or any uh, thing you can add to that. You know, I uh, was just talking to Nick Pineson two days ago, who's the guy who did that work, 
Um, and I've seen pictures of making those collections, but I don't know what the what the status is. I'll um, I'll ask him. Mm -hmm. Check in with it. I'm kind of curious. And we, you know, Nick has um, got a visiting scientist from Japan with him right now called Kumiko Matsui, who um, is a student of Makoto Manabe's in Tokyo. And she's a Desmo stylus expert. And, and Ray and I have become quite the Desmo stylus fiends um, <laughs> because it's the one group of extinct marine mammals. And we're quite keen to popularize Desmos, Desmophilia across the entire <laughs> North Pacific. They, indeed, they range from, indeed. They go, Bravo. <laughs> range from Baja California to Alaska back down to Japan. So um, there, there needs to be a giant Desmo festival. And um, there <laughs> is, there are Desmos from Vancouver Island. So mm -hmm. um, there need to be more. That's, I think, is there a behemotops from, from Vancouver Island? Yes, indeed there is. Yeah. <clears throat> Good stuff. Hey, and also just a second question on the, uh, mentioned the Stone Rose uh, Interpretive Center in New Republic. Uh, just to let people know that in British Columbia, the government has actually finally got their act together. And at the Maccabee site, they're planning an interpretive center and research center um, to be uh, the design, the architects are working on it. And it'll allow uh, the public to come and go to the interpretive center, it'll allow research people to come and do research there on that fantastic Eocene exposure, that ancient lake bed that dozens and dozens of papers have come out of in the last five or 10 years. So um, this is some good news that the provincial government is actually supporting paleontology with some funding and putting in interpretive centers, which is a kind of a, a first, you know, over and above the museums, of course, and um, just a, some future good news. That's that's really great news. That's that's um, we've all been worrying about Maccabee. I'm glad to hear that Maccabee is going to come into some access and some more research. They need to station a paleobotanist there 24 <laughs> seven. Exactly. So anyway, a big thank you, and you're always welcome to come to Vancouver Island, visit Graham, and visit the Courtney Museum, and the VIPS folks. And uh, thanks for the presentation. You bet. I'm I'm going to get there as soon as I can. I've been I've been trying to get to there since 2018, it's just been a, a few distractions like the time of COVID, but <laughs> yeah. what can you do? Yeah. Okay, so I so want much. to respect your time. It's 3.15, Kirk, you can tell us how long we can go. We can we can uh, say our thank yous and hold it here. How's your time? I've, I've got another 10 minutes for sure. All right, any last questions? Okay, so they have to be quick. Kent, are you asking a question or are you still have your hands up? No, all right, Casey, you're back up. Kirk, when are you going to be out in this part of the world again? Probably uh, as a short trip in June. I don't know. I, Ray and I got some Alaska plans this summer. So Alaska plans usually mean Seattle plans. Okay. Oh. Okay. Uh, I have a dinner that I'm arranging with a CEO of Ivar's that would be fun to include both of you. <laughs> that would be hysterical. So Acres of clams, man. I'm all over yes. it. Yes. Although we're going to go up the street and eat eat uh, Basque food up at at uh, at uh, um, Harvest Vine, uh, it's a long story. I'll sell it, tell you by email. Okay, perfect. Good. Perfect. And Julius, Julius will be our last question. Oh, okay. Well, uh, <laughs> big honor. Uh, quick question, actually. Well, quick question that might might have interesting uh, uh, ramifications in, in in a sort of a general sense, but. Um, you mentioned, you know, looking at tens of thousands of leaves of, of oak, for example, and finding like uh, 400 species and so on. Well, I remember looking at some of the living trees around our neighborhood and how much huge variation in leaf shape there is even within a single species, single individual. How do yep. you tell apart, uh, uh, you know, in terms of separated, disarticulated leaves from their plants when you have a new species versus variation in leaf shape? Uh, of, of the same species in the fossil record? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. I was, I just took a week off of being a museum director. I went back to Denver last week and wallowed in my collection, which is um, now, it's over a hundred thousand fossil leaves that I collected over the last 30 years. And the, they built a new collection facility in Denver. So it's really easy to look at lots of them. And the, the basic answer to your question is to collect a lot of really well-preserved and whole leaves and prepare them really well. So you have a lot of data to look at. What I find often, if you go look at people's leaf collections, 
they don't have that many leaves. A lot of them are broken and apart. They may be not that well preserved. So at the end of the day, there may only be a few specimens that have enough detail to even tell you what you're looking at. Um, but to really get serious about splitting a fossil flora into its components, you need lots and lots and lots of well-preserved complete specimens, which means you got to collect a lot. It means you have to collect carefully. It means you have to prepare the fossils well. Um, I always is super frustrated when I see a fossil leaf that's broken in half and missing part. It's like Fine. it was whole when you were digging it and you left the broken part in the hill. So that one's on you, whoever I'm talking to you right now. And, you know, so I, I, the whole thing about really thoroughly collecting lots and lots, then you get, so you have like from a, if a single quarry, you have five or 600 really good leaf specimens. Most fossil sites don't have more than 20 or 30 species per site. And if you have five or 600 good specimens, you can really pretty clearly see the variation. Okay. Okay. But if you have like 15 specimens and they're half, half a leaf, um, you just don't have enough information to make the right decision. So it really is comes down to this case, more digging, great curation and excellent preparation. And then you can start to answer those questions. And is it's it more like, just, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Is it more just kind of a visual um, uh, inspection of it or do you apply things like principal components analysis or CCA to actually separate out species from? You know, you know there, there's, a big, um, there's a big battle going on right now in the world of leaf uh, paleobotany and leaf architecture. We, we published in 2010, a book called, I guess it was 2009, a book called The Manual of Leaf Architecture out of Cornell Press. Um, and it's like the 100 page book on how to describe a leaf and what to look for. That's the first thing to look. And then um, even then you're looking at discrete characters and we haven't found a lot of success with um, uh, statistical analyses so far. Peter Wilf at Penn State is starting to try to apply artificial intelligence to leaves. Oh, interesting. Um, and he's created a data set which is available online now out of PhytoKeys where he's posted 30,000 fossil, uh, well, 30,000 leaf images. About half of them are modern cleared leaves show with the, the um, chlorophyll bleached out and stained. So you can actually see the modern vanation and about half are fossil leaves from various Eocene sites around the uh, Western North America. So you have, a, it's like a big reference set wow. of fossil leaves. So that's a good place. It's, um, I can send the fossil huntress the um, link the Fido Keys article, then you can download all 30,000 leaves. Awesome. <laughs> you can look at your heart's content. Wow. Um, it, even Thank so, you. that's like a, um, a fairly incomplete set because it's, you know, there are 75,000 different kinds of living trees. There's about 400,000 species of living plants. That number goes way up when you think about the fossil ones. Yeah. And the, this set basically, um, he went and illustrated a bunch of our good fossils from Republic, from Green River, from Florissant, and a couple of our sites in Patagonia, um, but it's a very incomplete set. Even with 30,000 leaves, it's a very incomplete set, but it's the best thing we have right now. Oh, and also we just finished um, uh, scanning our herbarium at the Smithsonian. We had a uh, conveyor belt and we scanned 5 million herbarium sheets. We scanned 5,000 sheets a day for over four years. Wow. And if you go to the smithsonian.collections.org webpage, you can search on any botanical <laughs> genera and you'll see all of our herbarium sheets. That's a good way to go as well. It's the most accessible herbarium in the world now. Nice. But that was, and even when I was down there the other night, they're like, the conveyor belt is still running. And my poor botanical assistants are like, oh my God, when is this gonna end? <laughs> it's a, uh, but it's, you know, 5 million specimens. Wow. So there's, those are two resources that are available now. I'll look into that, thank you. The leaf, the leaf incline. But I'm always, you know, I'm always happy, Julius, if you wanna, Come pull drawers sometime. I'm happy to give you a guide oh, yeah. through vegetation. I'd love to. <laughs> thank you. Well, to everyone, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Ray Troll, for the beautiful introduction. Dan Bowen for being the lead and chair of the VIPS for this year's 2022 year of awesome. Great questions, an amazing talk. Kirk, I'll make sure that it, whatever links you send through, they will be live on your page, which will stand and will post. Um, the edited version of this talk, uh, criminal behaviors, et cetera, pre-talk notwithstanding <laughs> in the recording. And um, and we will do our best on to make it a Desmos stylus philic world. Um, Ooh. 
Yeah. So yeah this will be very good. All of you are welcome uh, for to our uh, series of talks. For those of you who are deeply, deeply amazing, as is Kirk, um, you're welcome to give a talk. We're booked out now until spring of 2023. I will, uh, not directly after this talk, because I'm prepping for an audit in a few minutes, but I will put your talk up, Kirk, on YouTube. And thank you. Thank you so deeply again. And I have more questions, so I'll, I'll email those separately. So thank you, everyone, for a great talk, and we'll talk to you all soon. Bye. Thank you, Kirk. Bye-bye. Thanks, Kirk. Thanks, Kirk.